Well, thank you to uh, those of you who made the music uh, possible this morning. I appreciate that for your ministry to us this morning and this evening. Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter number 13. We have been working our way through the Olivet Discourse. <clears throat> Last Sunday, we focused our attention more on the Christmas uh, aspect, and so we were not in Mark, but I want to return to uh, <clears throat> the Olivet Discourse this morning and finish it. Do you guys want to stand? We usually, we usually stand while I read, so... We're going to begin in verse number 28 and read to the end of the chapter. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When her branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is near. So ye in like manner, when ye shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants, to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. And let's pray. Lord God, I pray that you would give to us wisdom and understanding of your words. And Father, you know exactly what the plan is. You know exactly the moment. You know exactly the time. And I pray that you would teach us your word and give us the application that you intend. Help us to take it to heart, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may, of course, be seated. So again, we have been working our way through the Olivet Discourse, which I would understand, I think, most broadly, most generally, not to be an attempt to map out a specific blueprint of eschatological events, but Two assurances. Assurance number one, that the upcoming crucifixion of Jesus Christ is not the end of what God is doing on the earth. That, and it will look like the end. And, and we, we've, we've talked about that. Even the apostles seem to struggle with what the, what the long-term ramifications of the crucifixion were. Satan certainly believed he had accomplished his purposes. The Olivet Discourse is notification to us that God is not done in light of the crucifixion. And secondly, the Olivet Discourse is an assurance to us that God has not forgotten his people. That whatever happens, God will remember and recover his people. And and I think that the significance of that is found that the last thing he says in verse number 27 before he goes into the application portion of the parable is just that, is that he is going to gather together his people. And so however we are working to put all the parts of the puzzle together about future events and where they all fit, we don't want to miss those two main points, that, that the work of Christ is not ended because Christ is killed and that God has not forgotten his people no matter what transpires in the world. <clears throat> and having said verse number 27, Jesus then begins to apply what he has said to us. And quite honestly, some of the complexity of the Olivet Discourse 
emerge only when Jesus begins to apply the teaching to us. It is in the application portion that we come across some of the most problematic passages. Because the application itself is, I think, deliberately ambiguous. And the ambiguity is part of the problem. There is, for all that Jesus says, verses 28 through 37, there is really only one application. There is only one point that he is making, and that is that everybody at every time, whenever the time is that they are alive on this earth, needs to be ready for his return. Everybody needs to be ready. Now, we will come back to that at the very end, but that is the application. As Jesus begins to apply it, and the way that we're going to follow it, is that Jesus, first of all, talks to us about what we do know, what we can know, and what we do not know. So let's begin in verse number 28. Here are some things that we know. Right? And it's right there, <clears throat> verse number 28. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When her branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is near. You know that. Now olive trees are very common in Jesus' world, just like corn is very common in our world. And the illustration that he is using is really nothing other than a very familiar illustration. And I say all that because sometimes people want to find all kinds of references to Israel in his use of the olive tree in this instance. That that there's coded messages or specific references to Israel. And, And he's talking to Israelites. But in Luke 21, 29, Jesus in Luke's rendition of the Olivet Discord says this, He spake to them a parable, Behold the fig tree and all the trees. In other words, folks, what is true of the fig tree is true of every other tree. We don't have fig trees in Omaha, but we have pine trees, we have maple trees, we have oak trees, we have linden trees, we have ash trees. They all follow the same, well, pine trees because they're evergreen type trees, but they all follow the same type of trajectory. We know when the leaves begin to appear, when the, when the branches put out the buds, we know that this is an indicator of spring and that summer is close. That's the point that Jesus is making. You know this. All right, so everybody understands this fundamental lesson about nature. We know the signs of spring. Verse number 29, so ye in like manner when ye shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh, even at the doors. So here's another thing that you know. Here's another thing that we know. When you see these things, know that it is nigh, even at the door. That should raise two questions in our mind, folks. Number one, what are the things that we see And number two, what is the it that is near? Because that's what Jesus has said. When you see these things, know that it is near. Well, the very first thing that Jesus said would be seen is found in verse number 14. When ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. That is the first thing that he said would be seen. And we're not going to go back and revisit all of Daniel chapter 9. But the abomination of desolation is not a person. It is a thing, an event, place. It occurs in the middle of the last of Daniel's 70 weeks. We would argue that it is right smack dab in the middle of what we call the tribulation, that it is actually the beginning of what we distinguish from the tribulation with the great tribulation. 
this three and a half year period of time. Revelation, let me just read to you some verses from Revelation. You're certainly welcome to turn to them, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time waiting for us to get oriented in those passages. Revelation 11.3, I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, or three and a half years. Revelation 12.6, the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days, three and a half years. Revelation 12, 14, and to the woman were given the wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time, a year, times, two years, and half a time, three and a half years. Revelation 11, 2, but the court which is without and the temple leave out and the measure it not for it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months, three and a half years. Revelation 13, 5, there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months, three and a half years. When you see the abomination of desolation, it occurs at the midpoint of the tribulation, the 70th week, these are the things <clears throat> that are come to pass. There will be a period in verse number 24 of people not seeing. In those days after the tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars of heaven shall fall, powers that are in the heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. So my understanding, folks, would simply be that in verse number 29, right? I mean, we, we, we start with something that is blatantly obvious that everybody can relate to. That when the leaves start to put forth, you know that summer is coming. All right, and when you see these things, when you see the abomination of desolation, you see those events that are predicted when you see those things, when you see that the sun is darkened and the moon doesn't give her light, then you know that it is, come, it is nigh even at the doors, which again leads us to the second question, what is the it? What is the it of verse number 29? Know that it is nigh. And again, folks, we find Luke's gospel very helpful to us. Luke 21, verse 31 so likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. So when you see, the, right, so when, you, when we see, right, I mean, here we are, we're just getting ready to go into January, the two ugliest months of winter are upon us, and then will come March, and one March day or April day, we will know that summer is coming. When you see these things, you will know that the kingdom is coming. And with reference to those things that are known, then, these are things that we know, verse 28, verse number 29. We know these things. Jesus then gives two assurances. Verse number 30. Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. Now this is one of the most problematic passages in the entire passage, folks. What does Jesus mean in verse number 30? All right, when we see these things, when we see the abomination of desolation, when we see the things that describe from that point going forward, we know the kingdom is near. What does verse number 30 mean? And there are many, many, many good people who insist that what Jesus means in verse number 30 is that the people who were listening to him speak at that time would not go away until they had seen them come to pass. So that Peter, James, John, 
the other apostles, however many other people were there, that their generation would survive. And Jesus doesn't mean every individual would survive, but that every, but that, that generation would not go away. Now what happens, folks, if that's what Jesus means, if Jesus means that everything he has been talking about is going to unfold in Peter's generation, then what then then that then I don't want to say obviously, but it's hard to find a better explanation than the destruction of Herod's temple in AD 70. But understand that when you do that, you must put the entirety of the book of Revelation into that time frame. That everything virtually that is being described in the book of Revelation is being described with reference to the destruction of that temple in AD 70. And this is one of the reasons that people who take that approach, <clears throat> that what Jesus is doing is assuring, and I, can't, I keep using Peter, but Peter, James, John, anybody, that that generation was going to see these things unfold. If you, if you do that, if you then bring all the book of Revelation, or almost all the book of Revelation, and impose it over A.D. 70, then you are invariably forced to conclude with reference to the return of Christ and the kingdom into one of two positions. One is called amillennialism, that the book of Revelation is pretty much just describing the ongoing conflict between good and evil in which people suffer and and there are triumphs and setbacks and agonies and, and ultimately God will bring everything to a good conclusion and we'll all be in heaven. Another option is the post-millennial option, that Christ, and I, I have a hard time even getting my mind around all the logic of this, because historically, by the way, folks, amillennialism is the classic position, but there are post-millennialists, people who believe that Christ is not really yet returned and will return at the very end of time after we have labored adequately to prepare a place for him. And I don't want to get into post-millennialism. The, the, the whole logic of it is really lost on me. But let's be realistic. Let's go back to the text here. Right? I argue, we argue on and on and on that we are biblical literalists. And that a literal reading of verse number 30 would insist that it is the generation to whom Jesus is speaking that will not pass away. But I'm not sure that that's really what Jesus means. I think that Jesus means the generation that sees those things beginning in verse number 14 will not pass away. Now, that view is highly criticized by the other people who say what you really mean then is it's that generation. And yes, that's what I think. I think that Jesus means that generation. Well, then why didn't he say that generation? And the answer to that, folks, is that when it comes to prophetic events like this, Jesus tends to talk always in present tense terms. All throughout the application here, he's talking in present tense terms. Everybody is to be ready. Jesus could come at any time. So everybody is to be ready. So it could have been Peter's generation. It could have been St. Augustine's generation, 5th century. Could have been Martin Luther's generation, 16th century. Could have been Spurgeon's generation, 19th century. Could be our generation. Could be our generation, 21st century. But here's the assurance, folks, right? There, There are these assurances that are given. 
here's what you know. You know how the seasons work. Okay, you know how this season will work. When you see these things, then you will know that it is, it is, the kingdom is here. And again, I think that what he means is whoever sees, whoever sees the budding of the trees in effect, whoever sees the abomination of desolation, they're going to see the thing through to the end. That generation isn't going anywhere because it's all going to unravel in a hurry. <coughs> Excuse me, verse 30 then. Here's the assurance number one. <clears throat> I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. It will be fulfilled. <clears throat> that was the first question that the apostles asked when Jesus said the whole temple is coming down. They said, when? When? When will all these things be fulfilled? They will be fulfilled. <clears throat> they will be fulfilled. And then verse number 31, folks, you have the second assurance. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Two of the most stable things in the entire universe will go out of existence before the word of God will go out of existence. Heaven and earth will go away before the word of the Lord goes away. These are the assurances. So here's what we know. <clears throat> Here is what we know. We know that what God said is going to come to pass. <clears throat> we know that it is. And we know that that word is more enduring and more long-lasting and more stable and more solid than the very universe in which we live. But then in verse number 32, Jesus immediately changes direction on us by telling us what we don't know. Verses 28 and 29 are what we do know. Verse number 32 is what we don't know. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son but the Father. So you know that it's going to happen. <clears throat> you know that some generation is going to see it. Again, e even if it's Peter's generation, you're going to see it come to pass because the, the promise is more certain than the universe in which we live. But here's what nobody does know. Nobody knows the day. Nobody knows the day. Nobody knows the hour. The angels don't know. Even at this point in time, Jesus didn't know. He does now, I think, obviously, but at the time he didn't. Only the Father. Only the Father knows. So you know this, and you know this, but you don't know this. Right? Do, we see, do we see the dilemma that we're up against? Jesus has been talking to us from the very beginning. Now, now, these are the things that are going to happen. These things are going to happen, and this world is going to look like this, and there's going to be this persecution, and then there's going to come this unprecedented pressure, and there's going to be the abomination of desolation, and the kingdom is nigh, and we have all of these things. <clears throat> Only to get to the very end, and Jesus says, but nobody knows exactly when. Nobody knows exactly when. Now, let me tell you what I think. And you don't really come to church to hear opinions, but this is, this is where I'm comfortable in understanding the text. Look, folks. <clears throat> I don't believe that Jesus meant the culmination of all things was the destruction of, of the temple in A.D. 70 because I just have to surrender too much of the book of Revelation to everything else. <clears throat> if this generation was Peter's generation and all of the events of the, of the Revelation 
were fulfilled then. It's, to me, it's just too great a price to pay. But here's what I do think. I think that verse number 32 is an allowance for the rapture. It is a provision for the rapture. I have argued passionately, and I will stand by my argument that there are no signs of the rapture, that the Olivet Discourse is not about the rapture, that looking for signs of the time and trying to apply them to the rapture is a fool's errand. But I think there is some provision there. And in fact, let me ask you to do this, please. If you, I know that we're in Mark, but let's go back to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24 is Matthew's rendition of the Olivet Discourse. Excuse me. And his application begins in Matthew 24, 32 and continues all the way into chapter 25. Matthew 24, 32 into Matthew 25 are an extended application of the Olivet Discourse in Matthew. So let's, let's look at Matthew's extended explanation. <clears throat> Let's just go to verse number 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Well, we've heard that. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, not, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Well, we've heard that. We heard that in Mark. But we didn't hear this in Mark, verse number 37. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, and giving in, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Now again, folks, <clears throat> in light of what the Revelation tells us about the tribulation, and the destruction of the earth and the power of God over the earth to steal, to steal, no, that's a terrible word, to, to deprive the world of prosperity, peace, to bring disease, death, destruction. It's kind of hard to see a world that's the one like Noah knew, where everybody was just living a normal life. I mean, that's the point, folks. Of, of what's going on, right? They were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. I mean, life just went on as normal. They were just doing normal things. And then Noah got in the ark and the end was upon them. Or verse number 40. <clears throat> then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken and the other left. Watch ye therefore, watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. It's the same application. <clears throat> so it's just kind of like this. <clears throat> right on the one hand, we have all of these explanations about how bad things will be set side by side with Matthew's explanation of how normal things will be, all colored by the same event. Definite, identifiable markers. <clears throat> and yet it is a complete and total surprise. Now again, folks, and those of you that are well-versed in eschatology know that the rapture is not the return of Christ. It is not his appearing. It is, it is not his coming back to earth, his literal, physical, visible return to earth.
But I think that the door is opened. I think that the provision is made. And that brings us finally then, going back to Mark, to the only application that Jesus makes. Right? I mean, here's where we are, folks. There are things that we know. We don't all agree on what we know, but there are things that we know, and there are things that we don't know. But there's only one thing to do. There's only one thing to do. Verse number 33, Take ye heed. Watch. Be awake. Pray. For you know not when the time is. Verse 35, Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh. At even, midnight, cock crowing, in the morning. <clears throat> Verse 37, what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Watch. Everybody is to be alert. Everybody is to be ready at all times. Why? Because our Lord is coming. Because our Lord is coming. This is what he argues in verse 37. The Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey. He's going off on a long trip. Who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. I mean, look, folks, this is exactly what Jesus did at his ascension. He went back and he gave everybody their responsibility and he gave everybody their assignment. And so everybody is to be ready. Some of us are going to meet the Lord, we believe, by being raptured out of here, but we are going right into the presence of the Lord. Some folks are going to meet the Lord when he returns to the earth, but they will be in the presence of the Lord. The Lord is coming back. And the admonition is do not get caught unprepared. Do not get caught unprepared. And that leaves, leads me then to two points in conclusion. Prepared how? Ready in what way? I'm watching. What am I watching for? What am I ready for? Well, first is the readiness of salvation. And had we gone extensively into Matthew's account in verse number 25, in Matthew's application of the parable, it would become very clear. You have the, you have the, the parable of the ten virgins. All throughout Matthew 25, we have this kind of illustration. And the final verdict that Jesus renders is, I do not know you. I do not know you. This is, this is gospel language for you are not saved. I do not know who you are. Listen to the way Paul puts it in Galatians 4.9. But now, after that ye have known God, Right? And there's a lot of that in our world. We talk about knowing the Lord and having a relationship with the Lord and being known to the, known to the Lord and, and walking with the Lord. And that's, that's all good. But that's only one part of the equation, folks. But now after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God. Because it is a two-way recognition. I know God and God knows us. So there is the necessary readiness of salvation. Of preparing oneself spiritually to be brought into the presence of the Lord, to have only the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And secondly, for those who are saved, there is the readiness of good stewardship. This is what is being argued, I think, in Mark 1334, for the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. We all have things that we are to be doing, that we are to be doing with a view to the Lord. We are to be living our lives. And really, folks, this is, this is 
all of our lives being oriented to God. That God is all in all and over all in all that we do, ready to meet him, because when he comes, there is judgment. Let's pray together this morning. Our Father, I pray that we would be ready, that our souls would be ready, that we would be robed only in the righteousness of Christ, that we would joyfully abandon any notion of our own goodness, our own merit, our own works, and rely completely upon the work of Christ. And then I pray that you would help us to live as good stewards of the grace that you have given to us, that we may never be ashamed at your appearing. And I pray this for us in Christ's name. Amen.